If you're ever at the Watertown Middlebury border on Straits Turnpike, check out Legend of Superheroes. They've been good to me and now they're becoming good to the site. Look at all the local and big name con professionals I've been able to talk to this year thanks to their conventions. And add to that list, Billy Tucci. Mostly known for his original character, She, he was at the Legend of Superheroes store to promote his Sergeant Rock story and his dream project, The Telling of the Nativity. Pay attention and you may learn about more than just comics. I'm Billy Tucci and I'm coming to you from Middlebury, Connecticut at a wonderful store called Legends of Superheroes. I've been doing comics for 17 years now. I've been very fortunate. I guess I'm best known for my comic book character She, which is a, pretty much a modern day samurai story. And uh, because of that, I've been able to, to branch out into the mainstream and I've been uh, did some fun work on for Marvel and for DC, most recently uh, uh, Birds of Prey, um, uh, and uh, Sergeant Rock the Lost Battalion, um, Star Spangled War Stories, a whole bunch of covers, and uh, now I'm proud to uh, say I just produced my book, hey, sorry, <laughs> um, A Child is Born. I wanted to tell the Christmas story through my new, my new self-published company called Apostle Arts, created specifically for this. So, so how did you get into comics? Ooh, I've been, I guess my senior year of, of college, I really got into the idea of comics and I went to school for illustration. So uh, it was literally probably the last week I was in school that I decided that I wanted to make a living out of doing comics. I love the medium. I love uh, that you could, you get an idea and you could just put it down in paper and, uh, and you could create, you know, you pour your ideas out on paper and people could buy it and look at it and, and, and uh, I just think it's a wonderful medium. What sort of, what influenced you as a, as a writer and an artist? Well, as a writer, I guess what really influences me is, uh, is, is I'm a big Hemingway fan. I'm a huge Hemingway fan. Um, probably my favorite writer. But I've also do a lot of historical work, so I really gravitate towards a lot of historians. Um, in reference to comics, uh, my biggest influences, I guess, were uh, Joe Kubert, um, Dave Stevens, huge influence on me. Um, a lot of fashion illustrators, believe it or not. And uh, just a lot of the greats, you know, John Buscema. You know, uh, Walt Simonson, Walt, Walt Simonson, um, man, so many of them. I can't even begin to tell you. How did, how did fashion get into that? I went to school for fashion illustration. That's what my major was at college. I was a fashion illustration major. Because um, I just, I guess I like drawing pretty women. <laughs> I don't know anything about clothes. <laughs> what was your first big break? My first big break literally was... Um, I did, uh, I approached a, at a New York Comic Con in 1993, I met Everett Hartso. After being rejected by every other publisher, he had a, a, a company, a small press called London Night Studios. And I got to do a crossover with him in the Razor Annual and introduce my character, She. Um, the book came out, uh, no one saw it, but then uh, I decided to uh, self-publish my own book in the meantime. while and. She number one came out in March of 1994, and man, we've sold three million books since, and she's been translated into five different languages, and uh, it's, she's, man, we've sold, the character she has probably sold over $25 million. So we're going to get that in this. I'm getting a show, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Um, so, she, who publishes she? Uh, the, I, know I did Crusade, Crusade, my, my company, Crusade Fine Arts. Um, and I still publish every year, um, but I publish uh, my sketchbooks, a lot of our prints, things like that. But I really got burnt out from it, especially when I then, then we had kids. You know, I got married, had children, and I wanted to spend my time, if I wasn't spending time with the children or with my family, I wanted to spend it creating. When you're a self-publisher, you're doing so much business. You do, you know, that takes up 90% of your time as the business aspects of it. And I wanted a better way of life for myself until um, Apostle Arts that I created with two friends of mine. 
um, Jason Pete and uh, Evan Archilla from down in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas. And uh, thank God that they're taking on a lot of the business stuff and I can just focus on creating. Oh, that's good. That works out. Yes, sir, it does. So what is she about? She is, is basically, as I said, it's a modern-day samurai story of a young woman who's been raised since childhood to partake in this shadow war that's existed for centuries between various sects of um, warrior monks, descendants of the warrior monks of medieval Japan. And this war has since carried over into politics and into the arts, business and things like that, but they still maintain themselves as rivals from the Kyoto sect to the Japan's first capital, which is Nara. And it's all about this one woman's journey of her breaking away from this war that she's been drafted into, and it's about faith and, and uh, self-discovery and um, but what happened is now she has since, after she's, you know, partook in this war and started a lot of battles, she's now hunted. So it's, it's her using her wits and things like that to try to stay alive. How long have you been publishing this? <laughs> 1994. 94? 1994 to 2004 I published it and uh, then went to Dark Horse. And then Dark Horse published the, the next series. And, uh, but I'm thinking about getting back into it again. Because again, that, you know, I had kids starting, you know, 2002 my first son was born and uh, you know again I, I'm tired of pulling my hair out of my head with the business mm, stuff yeah. bills and fighting for space in the in the distributor catalogs and printing prices and you know it's it's business a lot of work yeah. takes out that saps you of your creativity mm. must be tough and you gotta figure out how to pay the bills and everything yep what, is, what inspired the concept uh, for she? Oh, I Japanese woodblock prints. I was a big fan of Japanese woodblock prints and samurai films, believe it or not. Now, she's not a samurai. She's a sohai, which is, again, those were the warrior monks of medieval Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just very interesting how they weren't monks at all. They were pretty much just samurai ordained as monks. Mm -hmm. And they had families and things like that. And uh, they were pretty bad. Some of them were pious. And most of them were just... You know, just lived at, you know, you know, they just stayed at the temple and built the temple strength and power and influence throughout Japan. So, that was it. That's really what a Toshiro Mifune's, I'm a huge Toshiro Mifune fan, so I love his films and Kurosawa films. And, and again, I just love the art. The culture is just fascinating. I find the Japanese culture just fascinating. Now, in addition to self-published work, you've also uh, done work for some of the major companies like Marvel and DC. Yep. In fact, one of the books you're um, displaying here is Sergeant Rock, The Lost Battalion. Yes. Which, uh, it's right there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, how, which you prefer better, working on, uh, on DC and Marvel stuff or working on uh, your own stuff? No, working on my own stuff, but I just love Sergeant Rock and um, I was given the opportunity because it, it's not, doesn't bar with any continuity or anything like that because Rock hasn't been in hasn't been in continuity since 1988 so it was good to just tell I'm a huge world huge World War II buff and a big fan of the US soldier so I wanted to do a book that that uh, that, that told about the this particular battle for the lost battalion which involved 275 men surrounded cut off by 7,000 Germans and they're battle to stay alive and fighting off these Germans and uh, the heroic relief that the Japanese Americans of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team partook in a mission to break through to them and uh, just extraordinary heroism what an amazing story in the worst conditions possible so this is and, based on actual events, yeah, actual events uh, from 23 October 1944 to October to the 30th of October 1944 in the Vosges Mountains of northern France, eastern France. And um, just I got to meet a lot of these veterans, you know, and, and interview them. And I went to Normandy and I went to the Vosges Mountains. And uh, it was, wow, just the most rewarding work of my career, I feel. Because I got to tell the story and how I feel for these men to, to, uh, to let others know about it and show my appreciation and uh, it's been a great success and I became friends with a lot of them, a lot of the veterans and almost like an adopted grandson. So last year I was actually the keynote speaker, one of the keynote speakers to uh, the friends and family of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team 
the Japanese Americans uh, to their reunion, their annual reunion in Las Vegas, and I got to meet a lot of them and hang out with them. It was great. Yeah, this is something I haven't heard about. There were Japanese Americans fighting on our side during the war. Yeah, yeah, the most decorated combat unit in the entire war. They had 21 medals of honor. Um, they they couldn't fight the Japanese. They wouldn't let them fight the Japanese, but they fought the Germans, and they would just thrown, given the worst jobs possible because of racism, the generals didn't care, but they were amazing soldiers. Mm -hmm. And if you read the Lost Battalion, you'll see, you know, we'll talk all about them. That's interesting, because usually when you hear about uh, the World War II, you hear the either concentration camps yeah. or just the... Yeah, and the our, extraordinary our thing is, the ones on the mainland, they volunteered out of these camps to fight, because they wanted to fight. They wanted to, to fight for America. Hmm. And for freedom, while their own families were interned behind barbed wire, they're out there dying for another's freedom. Hmm. Extraordinary. Yeah. So, so, so that's what's, what this book here is about. Yep, then. yep. So how do you segue from all that into, uh, into uh, the story of Jesus? Well, I've always wanted to tell the Nativity story. I've, uh, it's been a dream project of mine for 10 years now. And uh, it just started, it, it really was started with a whim that I got to meet one of the heroes of the Lost Battalion's grandsons, mm -hmm. Evan Archilla. His grandfather, um, Lieutenant Colonel A.L. Archilla, was one of the fighter pilots that was charged with protecting and resupplying the Lost Battalion. Only eight, fi only eight pilots were flying for that week because the weather was so bad of the entire United States Army Air Force. The, every other plane was grounded except for these eight volunteers, and, her, and his grandfather was one of them. A wonderful man, and I got to meet him last year, and, and down in Texas, and we went at, and we went to dinner. Evan and I, his grandson, and he said, "Wow, so you did your magnum opus, huh?" And I'm like, "Well, what I really want to do, what, what I hope to be my magnum opus, is is um, the the birth of Jesus." And I never told anyone that except for my wife, hmm. and he loved the idea, and. I got a call from him a week or two later asking me if I'd be interested in partners on that book to make that book a reality and they flew me down to San Antonio and we spent I spent a weekend with Evan Archilla, Jason Pete, my other partner and their families and man we all just hit it off like peas and carrots. It was <laughs> awesome. We had the same ideals, the same goals that we wanted to, to, to tell the Christmas story of what Christmas is all about and to do it in the most honest way possible but also in the most beautiful way possible and uh, it was just it's it's an amazing partnership and they're like brothers to me now and I think we've done it we've been getting incredible reviews the response has been amazing to the book I've been doing radio interviews all week long and uh, it's good you know that we're spreading God's word and 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 you know, really reminding people what Christmas really is all about. So you're a Christian yourself? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. That, so that was certainly some inspiration. Yep. Yeah. Now I've i I have a comic already that has the Christmas story in it. I I've, I've seen uh, at least two or three different Wreck and Bass specials about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've seen all sorts of different versions of it. What do you bring to a child is born that's different from other? Well, I wanted to bring the human aspect to it all. You know, I wanted to focus on Joseph and Mary, um, specifically Joseph as well, and, and to say just what an amazing man he was of what he did, because he literally had the weight of the world on his shoulders, this man. And he took it upon himself to take care of this child that wasn't even his. And it's about his strength as well and his faith. But and Mary, but also we wanted to discern. We we, we bring about um, just what the star of Bethlehem was, and that was done in conjunction with Rick Larson, um, who contributed to the book and gave us his all his research that he did, and uh, what the star that the Magi followed, and when it came over, when it land, when when it landed, when it what what, what led them to the baby Jesus, and uh, it's all in the book, and I think it's gonna. I think it's going to pleasantly surprise a lot of people, and it's all true. When, when that star was over Bethlehem, and and it was Christmas Day, when that star was there, and that's the day that the Magi visited Jesus. The Magi did not visit Jesus in the manger. Jesus was most likely born in the spring or early summer. But by the time the Magi came was when Mary and Joseph were living in a house in Bethlehem. And uh, it's pretty cool. Usually you see them 
Like, yeah, and that's not every, true. Even the nativity sets. Yep. Yeah, the, and that's what my wife is, is really pissed off at me because I consistently <laughs> keep moving the Magi to the other end of the house from her nativity set. <laughs> and I'm driving her crazy doing it. So, They're like, but it's not true. They weren't there. On Christmas Day, I'll put them there. But then we have to move the shepherds out. <laughs> Time warp. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> You're in comics. You can understand. Yeah. Comics. Yes, sir. Yeah. Quantum realities and all that. Uh, so, now that, you, now that you've done the the uh, birth of Jesus, are you going to go on to the life of Jesus? I would love to do. We're hoping to to publish in for Easter 2013 to do um, uh, seven days about the Easter story. Easter story. Really want to tell the Easter story. So hopefully that'll be, you know, that'll be a project coming up that I can start next year sometime. Hmm. And what about the uh, in between, the, the stories of Jesus in between? Would you be doing those? I would love to do this, but I really feel strong. And I would, of course, I would love to become a Christian publisher and make my <laughs> living doing that. Um, I have commitments now. I have a couple other books slated that I have to do, a new She series as well. But um, I would also love to work with other artists too. Other, you know, artists that, 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 that don't take it lightly and give it their all like I would and who, you know, who are believers and, and um, to have them tell the stories too. Because I love other people's interpretations. I'd love to write them all, to script them all, but I would love to see, you know, some of my friends, because I'm friends with the best artists in the world. <laughs> so I would love to get their interpretations of various you know, various um, verses, stories, things like that in the Bible of Jesus' yeah. life. Yeah, I've got a kind of an anthology graphic novel uh, called uh, Proverbs and Parables, which is all sorts of different... Uh, Ooh, I haven't seen that. I'd like to check that out. Yeah, they came out um, a lot of years ago. Oh, did it? Yeah. Proverbs and par Parables. Yeah. I'll definitely check that out. It was, it was a pretty interesting one. So, um, can you give us a little sneak peek as to what she's going to be doing? Uh, in the sure, yeah. She's going to be uh, about in her 40s. And this is all past, you know, all behind her. It's going to take place roughly 20, 17, 18 years after the Way of the Warriors storyline, the first one. And um, she's going to have a 15 year old daughter or a 16 year old daughter. And uh, she's married, Anna, you know, and it's all about. That's as much as I can give you. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, have you seen the Sergeant Rock 52, the new 52 version? Of no, Rock? not yet. I want to. I see I'm in a store. I've just been so busy, but I'm really looking forward to, to looking at it. Okay, and I see people who kind of want to meet you, so I'll just ask you one last question. Sure. Um, do you have any advice for anybody else who would want to get into comics? Yes. Don't uh, do it. Be honest with yourself. If you're not the best right artist, um, then write the story and get someone that you think could draw it. I would also do something unique. You see the books that have taken off in the past couple of years that have been self-published books. Like when I came out with She, you know, someone told me, girl, books don't sell. And She and Lady Death came out right around the same time and Vampirella as well, within weeks of each other. Yeah, we, none of us yeah. knew, you know, whatever anyone else was doing. And, uh, but, you know, look, you, you look at great books like uh, Mouse Guard, you know, something interesting. You look at books that are self-published books, Terry Moore, you know, with Rachel Ross, and then he came up with Echo, which was a complete different, a com you know, complete 180 from um, Strangers in Paradise. You know, things like that make it different. I wouldn't necessarily go for a superhero book because you're going to go head, you're going head to head with such amazing competition from the big guys, and and it's going to be tough unless your book looks better than any of their books. It's going to be really tough because not that. It's not good, but the retailers won't even give it a chance. Mm. I feel, and go with the web. Don't, you know, don't, don't if you do a web comic, you have to spend all that money on printing, and that's the most expensive aspects of the books. Yeah. And good luck. If you love it, do it. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right, Troy. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, buddy. Good luck. Good luck to it. To you. And um, I will definitely be posting a review of, of this book up on the site oh, this week. You. And, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Too. <laughs>